Kenya is on the African continent, directly at the equator, bordered by Tanzania, Uganda, and Somalia. It can be reached from Europe by plane in about eight hours. Its coast is washed by the waves of the Indian Ocean. The biggest city of the coast is Mombasa, which is at the same time the most significant port of East Africa. The coasts, with snow-white sand and palm trees, are surrounded by astonishing hotels. While a one- or two-hour drive away is the savannah, where you can see elephants, zebras, and giraffes displaying everything that this country, abundant in natural wonders, can offer the visitors. The tropical climate is steamy and hot all year round. The time of year which is the most pleasant and most suitable for holidays is the dry season from October to March. Mombasa, one of the most ancient settlements of Africa, was built on an island. It's a busy port and commercial center. For a long time, it was the capital of Kenya. The British colonizers, however, found it too steamy and hot, so they moved the capital to Nairobi, which, to everyone's knowledge, has a very pleasant climate. Mombasa is connected with the mainland by bridges and ferries. The best known is the Lakoni Ferry. Every tourist has to use this one if they want to go from the hotel at the coast to the mainland, or if they head inland. The local people like to rest in the shade of the baobab trees. The trunks of these trees are so wide, even ten people holding hands can hardly reach around them. Because of the continuously hot weather, these trees change their foliage at any time, so we can see trees with crowns and barren trees at the same time, together with trees in transition. The local children eat the fruit of these trees instead of sweets. Although Kenya has been an independent country since 1963, the memories of British colonial rule are still alive. Conspicuous, for instance, is the road traffic on the left side. English is still one of the official languages of the country, and, together with Swahili, it's an intermediary language for the different tribes. The newspapers and the street signs are all in English, which makes things easy for the tourists. It's relatively easy to communicate with the local people, not only in the hotels, but also in smaller villages. The colonists left many things behind, not only the buildings, but for instance the typical London-style taxis. Not all of them are working, but in Mombasa some of them are still in use. The golf courses and clubs are also of British heritage. They're frequented not only by tourists, but by local people also. A famous site of the city, the Fort Jesus, was built by the Portuguese 400 years ago. Mombasa was called the Island of War by no coincidence. The Portuguese attacked the city several times. Finally, they managed to occupy it in 1539. This is when they erected the fortress. Its developer was Mateus de Vasconcelos. The building was made of pure coral stone. Its walls reached 2.5 meters in height at some places. It was attacked many times by the Arabs of Oman. It was last defended from the British by the soldiers of the Sultan of Zanzibar. From 1875, it functioned as a prison, and following its renovation in 1960, it was reopened as a museum. From the seaside, it shows the image of a solid, impregnable fortress. From the towers, the sea and the new villa district can be seen.
The walls of the fort are painted at some places, at other places they've been darkened by time. The objects and drawings of Portuguese seamen, lifted from the remains of the shipwrecked Portuguese vessel, the Santo Antonio de Tanna, are among the most precious items of the museum. Fort Jesus stands in the old town, opposite the Arab district of Nidia Ku, whose winding alleys contain numerous antique shops. In the time of the British, Rails were laid down here so that ladies with long skirts didn't have to walk in the dirt while shopping. They were pushed around in small carriages by their servants. Most of the people in Kenya are Muslims, but a number of Christian churches and Indian temples may be found in the country also. On the charming square in front of the city hall of Mombasa, we may get a little taste of what the city was like in its heyday, in the 1920s and 1930s. Some of the beautiful white colonial style palaces, such as the building of the National Park of Kenya, have been renovated, and some others are waiting to be renovated. The most photographed site of Kenya, and virtually the symbol of Kenya, is the Elephant Tusk Archway. The arch, simulating the tusks of elephants bending over the road, was erected to commemorate when young Queen Elizabeth learned about the death of her father, as a result of which she became the ruler of the British Empire. In place of mosques and palm trees, nowadays office buildings reach to the sky. On the side of the wide highways next to colonial-style palaces, there are featureless, modern cement blocks threatening to ruin the atmosphere of the city. But a long walk may still give a true picture about what Mombasa might have been like over the centuries. The vegetable market was originally built for as a slave market. In the old times, there were people destined to terrible fates behind the bars, instead of heaps of pineapples and bananas. The market today is an interesting bright spot of the city. Everything can be bought here, what the land of Africa and the tropical climate has to offer. There are many choices, and the products are always fresh. We may also get professional instructions for the more exotic pieces. We can get to know the papaya and the mango, the flavor of which is a mixture of apricot and plum. We can see the tiny green cooking banana, unknown in Europe, the exotic red banana of Zanzibar, which is so sensitive that it cannot be shipped to large distances. It has a neutral, avocado-like taste, and it's great in vegetable and fruit salads. We know the pomegranate and the pineapple well. But the okra is a special vegetable, similar to green peppers. Of course, we can also buy spices here. Chili, curry, and ginger, for instance. The busy and noisy market is a pleasant, bright spot for the tourist in every city, but especially in an exotic tropical country. Like Nairobi, Mombasa has also been the starting point of safaris and hunting expeditions. In the 1920s and 30s, the city was crowded with world-famous travelers. Hemingway commemorates this in his African hunting diaries. 
famous, mostly aristocratic British, Italian, and Hungarian hunters, such as the English patient Count Almasi, Teleki, Gittenberger, and Seicini, sipped their drinks on the terrace of the quaint Castle Hotel, watching the crowd in the street. This is where they met their local guides, the White Hunters. This is where they recruited men, cooks, trackers, gun bearers, and porters for the expeditions. The glory of luxury hotels has passed with the fall of the colonial world. Now they're pondering in their Cinderella dream on the glorious past, waiting to be woken up and renovated to start a new life. Nearby, we may still find the shops where the equipments can be bought for expeditions, boots and tents, sleeping bags and pots, hunting knife and tropical helmet, anything one might need for a safari can be found here. In the streets bordered by colonial palaces, Muslim and Catholic churches and the richly ornamented Hindu temples are bright spots. Usually, only believers may enter, which makes it all the more interesting. Now you may admire the inside of the shrine, which largely differs from the interiors of churches of different cultures with its bright colors and its somewhat naive way of illustration. In Kenya, besides the natives, the Europeans and the Arabs, the Indian minority is also significant. Our next trip takes us to the railroad station, which is also a famous site. The British Parliament had debates for two decades whether to build a railway between the former and the present capital of the Kenyan province of the British Protectorate. Finally, after enduring a lot of danger and material sacrifices, the railway connecting Mombasa with Nairobi and leading further to Uganda was built. Nowadays, two trains run per day. There are first, second, and third class carriages in the train. And the first class has a sleeping car, fortunately, as the journey lasts 12 to 14 hours. The train is not only popular with tourists, local people often transport their goods to the market this way. Africa has always been famous for its wood carvings. In the Africa shops or colonial shops of foreign cities, the carvings of masks or bowls depicting black warriors or African animals always sell well. These products are sold all over Kenya. The most beautiful carvings are made by the Kamba tribe. This profession has been passed down from father to son over many generations. The men of the tribe are genetically coded for the knowledge and the love of wood. More than 700 of them are working in the shade of palm huts. They handle the tool, which is a mixture of axe and hoe, with magnificent skill. The items are illustrated with local patterns, of course, mostly Maasai warriors, giraffes, elephants and rhinos. The products bought here will always remind us of the people who made them.
Besides ornamental pieces, articles for personal use are also made here, such as spoons, bowls, platters, and small chairs. These local souvenirs can be bought here in the village of woodcarvers at the cheapest price and here is where we can find the widest product range of course. Diani Beach, to the south of Mombasa, is the most popular beach resort. A hotel complex has been built here that meets all expectations. The luxury bungalows have air conditioning and they stand in fabulous gardens with rich vegetation among bougainvilleas, agaves, Ethiopian blue pines and king palms. Those who seek real refreshment use the crystal clear fresh water of the swimming pools instead of the too warm water of the Indian Ocean. The park of the hotel is decorated by a kamba wood carving. What else? Sunshine, sea, palm trees, blue sky. Everything which is needed for a perfect holiday. The sandy beach is surrounded by tall palm trees and sunshades made of palm leaves. No separate fee has to be paid for the deck chairs we can lie on them all day. The organizers of the hotel will ensure that everybody has the opportunity for active recreation. Guests can play water polo or beach volleyball. And those who can endure the sun like a camel may ride one on the sand of the beach. We can look around and we can buy paintings or souvenirs from the sellers who settled on the beach. A 
a somewhat more cooling activity is to ride in the kickstand boat carved out of a tree trunk, which is a local peculiarity. It has a triangle-shaped sail, just like the larger Arab boats here, the dows. Because of their shape, windsurf board sails can be reused for this purpose. Don't be misled by the condition of the boat, although its rudder is probably made of recycled wood, perhaps having been part of a palm hut. It's safe. But if it happens to sink, the passengers can get to the coast without even getting their shorts wet, since the water is no more than 60 or 80 centimeters deep. As a result of it being so shallow, it gets hot easily. Running parallel with the coast, about a kilometer away, there's a coral reef. Inside of this, there's an emerald green shallow pool with warm water. And only over this reef starts the turquoise, deep, open ocean. This protection makes the coast of Kenya attractive for families with children and for those who can't swim. The hotels pamper the guests with some cultural or folk program or other entertainment. The most famous restaurant of the coast, Alibaba's Cave, can be found on the Diani Beach. This restaurant, specializing in fish and other fruits of the sea, is very elegant and isn't cheap. What makes it really stand out is that it's in a real coral cave. Its fanciful rooms, shaped by nature, are accessible by stairs. Its biggest hall is in the open air. While having dinner, we can see the magical starry night sky of Africa. The dim lights sunk in the coral walls give an intimate feeling. The pianist, dressed in tuxedo, plays a soft song on the white piano. The bar is lit by Tiffany lamps. On the tables there are candles. On the damask tablecloth there's a silver fish knife. The crayfish, the lobster, the fish, the clams and shrimps. There are no words to describe them. They must be tasted. Pili Pipa is the place where people can meet wild dolphins in their natural habitat, the travel agencies advertise. Actually, we can be part of a pleasant one-day sea safari. We may try the Arab Dao, this nicely decorated boat with a triangle-shaped sail, which takes us to the coral reef running around the coast of Kenya. On the trip, the staff of the boat pamper the guests with fresh fruit, pineapples, bananas, and melons. We may take delight not only in the beauties of the sea. The sight of the clouds is also spectacular. The sky above us is like a dome. At the top it's perfectly clear, cloudless, and below it's girdled by foam of white clouds. (music) 
In Africa, the scenery of the starry night is also spectacular. On the black velvet sky, the stars seem as if they were glowing closer to us than anywhere else in the world. The sunrise and the sunset are also special, because the dusk and the dawn take an unusually short time. Soon we may glimpse the dolphins that live in their natural habitat. Here they're not jumping through rings, not playing with balls, and not doing any other circus tricks. But they're very friendly and curious. They swim around the boat enthusiastically, mostly because the seamen feed them with fish sometimes. So what you have to do, a few minutes, just stop and let it out. Or the best is you can hold your mask here. The Tao anchors here. It's a perfect place for snorkeling. One may see the fantastic animal life of the coral reef, while the dolphins swim around them without letting themselves be touched. The spectacle of the fish living in the reef is dazzling. There are many shells here, but taking them home is forbidden. Recently, Kenya has been at the cutting edge of preserving the national treasures. Eight or ten ships are anchored here at the same time, showing this tropical paradise to hundreds of tourists. A lunch consisting of local specialities awaits the tourists exhausted from swimming at the next port. Except for the restaurant, the island is uninhabited, but its vegetation is particularly rich. The restaurant is covered by a roof of palm trees, supported by 15 meter high wooden poles. The building materials and the unusually large headroom serve the purpose of natural air conditioning by the circulation of the air. It can't be done any other way, since the building doesn't have side walls. are cooked from life and dressed in ginger butter sauce. It's a Kenyan maize meal cooked with the eggs, turmeric, and fried. At the middle is grated coconut kachumbari with a lemon juice, pint of chili, and onion. Among the courses, we may find corn polenta, batata, or sweet potatoes, soy sprouts, minced fish in a sauce, and seaweed fried in olive oil. The main course is spicy cooked crab. After the wine, the coffee and the fruit, the tourists may board the boat.
the dhow sets sail and with a strong wind reaches the port very fast, where the vans of travel agencies wait to drive tourists to their hotels. These luxury bungalows were built in a style similar to the restaurant, imitating the local palm huts. The park of the hotel complex here is also abundant in blooming tropical plants. Many swimming pools can be found in the park with all possible facilities, bubble bath and aqua massage. The designers made sure that those guests who get thirsty do not have to leave the water, and a drink bar was built in the middle of the swimming pool. The hotels here offer all-inclusive services, which means the price of the accommodation includes three main meals a day and unlimited drinks. In between the meals, the snack bar can be used, also free of charge which offers pizzas, hot dogs, hamburgers, spaghetti and salads. While in the bars, including the pool bar, free drinks are provided such as wine, beer, cocktails and soft drinks. If you don't want to lie in the sun, you can choose from a wide range of land and water sports. Guests may play darts, billiards, or table tennis, but there's also a golf course, and there are courses for drivers. Even those who only come to the beach of Kenya to bathe in the equatorial sun and swim in the pools or in the ocean must not miss the safari, which is a great experience both for the first time and on later occasions. The safari is not the dangerous and tiring activity that it used to be. Besides, it's not an elephant gun with a telescope that we have to carry, only a camera with a telescopic lens. There's some difficulty though, the Tsavo East being a two hour drive from the coast, so you have to leave the hotel at 4 a.m. After sunrise, we have arrived to Tsavo East National Park, which is famous for two things, both of them in connection with the lions. The male lions of Tsavo are the only ones in the world that do not have a mane. When looking at the railway station, you may remember that the building of the railroad was a very dangerous enterprise. That was because the lions of Tsavo developed a taste for human flesh and on one occasion snatched six Hindu workers in their sleep and tore them apart. The builders hired hunters to guard the workers from the attacks. One of the hunters also lost his life before they managed to shoot the lions. The case was a big sensation. The story was written up in a book, and a few years ago it was made into a film starring Michael Douglas and Val Kilmer.
While we're waiting to take a glimpse at some animals in the bush, let's mention another true story, which was a great success in both writing and in film. Danish Baroness Karen Blixen, the author of Out of Africa, lived in Kenya. In the film based on the book, her role was played by Meryl Streep, and the role of her husband by Robert Redford. In the eyes of the visitor, tired of civilization, the most attractive characteristic of Africa is its untouched ancient wilderness. This is what grabs all authors when writing about Africa, from Hemingway to Wilbur Smith. Here, the sun is brighter than back home, the stars more dazzling, the clouds darker, the storms more dreadful, the smells more overpowering, the contrasts more distinct. But even the thorn is more stinging, the wood more solid, the people more enduring, and the beasts more robust. In one word, the pulse of life beats more energetically here. This is what makes Africa serious. This is what draws back those who have ever tasted it. It's men's country, writes Zygmunt Sicini, one of the greatest hunters and writers about Africa. Instead of sad animals behind bars that we know from zoos, here we find proud, free animals in their natural habitat, which is an unforgettable experience. Although many tribes live in Kenya, such as the Kikuyu, the Luo, the Kamba, the Samburu, the Turkana, and the Ndorobo, the most famous tribe is the Maasai, these tall, thin, stout, and persistent nomads. The Maasai are known for opening the veins of cows and, after mixing the blood with fresh milk, drinking it in the absences of any other fluids. By European standards, this seems an unusual or barbaric custom, but the fluid is rich, substituting both food and drink. The village is surrounded by a fence made of thorny twigs, the boma, protecting the people of the village from wild animals. The walls of the houses, also woven from twigs, are plastered with a mixture of red earth and cow manure. The roof is made of palm leaves, and although they make the fire inside, they've never seen a chimney. The Maasai are shepherds who had to be able to protect the animals from the lions using a spear and shield. Only those boys are initiated into manhood who have killed a lion. Boys are circumcised, their two lower middle teeth are knocked out, and their ears are lengthened by placing bigger and bigger rings in them. Those who survive this may happily take part in the war dance, consisting mostly of high jumps.
When starting fires, they use an ancient method that they happily show to the tourists. Their clothes are characteristically red, just like the earth they live on. They sell handmade trinkets to the tourists, such as jewels or shields. One must not miss buying some of these original and cheap souvenirs. The realistic 3.5 meter statue of an elephant, decorating one of the hotels of the coast, was made by the most famous artist of Kenya for the millennium. We continue our journey southwards towards the border of Somalia. The next large settlement, in a distance of 120 kilometers, is Malindi. The road is surrounded by sisal plantations. This is an important industrial plant of the country. Its fibers are used to weave textiles, from which they make clothes, sacks, canvases, and ropes. The monotony of the plantations is broken by dignified palm and baobab trees. One should not miss out on the snake farm, where we can see some typical local snakes along with some other animals. The tamer ones we can even hold in our hands. The young reticulated python is not very dangerous to people, especially if it's not hungry. However, it's not advised to put the puff adder around your neck. The emerald green snake that lives in the crown of palm trees is especially beautiful and not dangerous at all. The harmless grass snake lives in a cage next to the venomous cobra. The green mamba lives mostly in mango trees. From there it falls on the victim who has 45 minutes to get the serum to survive the bite. The most venomous snake in Africa, the black mamba, is not so considerate, leaving only 15 minutes for the victim. We may see here lazy crocodiles, tame, color-changing chameleons, and porcupines. Even the lion is afraid of this nice little animal. 
because its quills stick in its sensitive nose and there's no way he can get them out. The Herman's tortoises were taken to Africa by seamen and they are rapidly multiplied here. The Varanus is a generally unfriendly giant lizard whose bite can be matched with the bite of a dog. However, the young ones can be tamed. And just like everywhere in Africa, you can find monkeys here. The White Memorial Pillar on the coast is an interesting sight. This is where white man first set foot on the land of black Africa in 1498. Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese explorer, was sent here by King Manuel to get to India by circumnavigating the African continent, which the traveler successfully achieved. On the course of his journey, he stopped here to refresh his reserves of food and drinking water. The 207 square kilometer area on the coast, reaching from Watamu to Malindi, is the Malindi Marine National Park. Tourists are taken here to the coral reef a few hundred meters away in a glass bottom boat so that those who do not dive can also admire the beautiful sea life. We can feed the colorful tropical fish by hand, and if we're patient enough, we can see many kinds of fish from up close. The last remains of the jungles, characteristic of the coast of East Africa, hide the mystic ruins of the city of Gedi. The foundation and the devastation of the city with its 3,000 residents is still a mystery. Most likely, it was settled in the 13th century. According to some, it was a port and a commercial center. But because of the withdrawal of the sea, it lost its function, and that is what led to its decline. According to others, it was founded by a group that migrated from Malindi. They attribute its devastation to the Nuno de Chuna, which also ruined Lake Mombasa. Still others suspect the encroachment of the nomadic Gala tribe of Somalia in the 16th century. The northeast part of the city belongs to the areas already excavated, together with the Great Mosque, the Palace, and the majority of the houses. The Great Mosque, or the Juma, was built in the middle of the 15th century, and it was rebuilt a hundred years later. It's a characteristic East African mosque with a square base and three gates. It can be accessed through the court, where we can find a well, a cistern, and an octagonal sepulchre. In the plaster of the old sepulchral vault, the date 1399 is carved. The stairs, starting from the covered veranda, lead to the rooftop, from where they called people for prayers. The mihrab shows the direction towards Mecca. The pillar of the mosque is characteristic of the African Arab culture. The main entrance of the palace is a pointed vault, which can be accessed by stairs. A corridor leads from the reception hall to the great hall, on the side of which there were platforms. The courts served as reception halls also, which is a characteristic of Gedi, just like the cistern storing rainwater. It's typical of the water culture that not only in the palaces, but also in the residential buildings, there was piped water and bathroom. Some of them even had separate toilets. Parts of the houses may have functioned as shops or warehouses. In one of them, a large number of scissors were found, 
in another wrought iron lamps, in still others ivory carvings and Venetian pearls. All this implies extensive commercial connections and a flourishing city economy. The Giriyama tribe lives next to the ruins of Gedi. They were called the tribe of the women with stretched breasts. The working women fed their babies on their backs by stretching their breasts over their shoulders. The British colonizers banned this century-old tradition of mutilation. Displaying their rich folklore, they present their lively dance to the tourists accompanied by the beating of drums. Kwaheri Kenya, goodbye.